maybe give me a second yeah so chaba is a professor of computing science at the university of alberta and a principal investigator of the alberta machine intelligence institute and the team led of lead of deep minds foundation team professor zepeswari is best known for his theoretical work on reinforcement learning and also as the co-inventor of uct which is a tree search algorithm that inspired much later work and served as the basis of numerous other uh, search methods in ai the paper that introduced uct won the test of time award at the conference the paper was published in professor zepeswari has published three books his most recent book from 2021 uh, summarizes the foundations of the theory of uh, bandit algorithms and he currently serves on the editorial boards of jmlr math of or and is also one of the co-chairs of icml 22 Uh, since 2021 he is also co organizing and co hosting the weekly rl theory virtual seminar so over to you chaba uh, maybe you can begin thank you um uh, do you hear me well so yes, this fine yes 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 we can see okay. you and we can hear you yeah okay cool uh so thanks for having me uh it's a pleasure It would have been so much nicer to be there in person, but okay, we know the conditions are not right for that. Maybe next time. Uh, but I'm very glad to see so many people here. And uh, so I plan to talk about new results that I'm really excited about uh, that we just obtained, I don't know, a month ago. Although these have been in the cooking uh, since for a while. And um, so, If you have any questions during the talk, please feel free to either raise your hand or use the chat. I'm going to look at the screen and uh, let's try to keep everyone on board during the talk. Uh, so with that, uh, let me get started. So this talk is about these new results on functional approximation to solve large scale planning problems in MDPs. And it's very much connected to Uh, what Dimitri was talking about, uh, we will see that uh, in, in some way it's it's really interesting this convergence of of things uh, from different directions. Uh, things are just coming together. Anyways, uh, so first I would like to thank uh, my wonderful co-authors, uh, from whom I've learned a lot, and without whom this. Uh, work would not have happened. Uh, so first and foremost, uh, Galliot Weiss, who is uh, a colleague at DeepMind and also a PhD student at UCL. And uh, he, is, uh, uh, he has contributed in the most fundamental ways uh, to this work. So a lot of, uh, lot of what I'm going to talk about uh, owes a, thank, a big thank to him. But uh, the other coasters are also very important. Uh, they are Philip, uh, Bonabash, Nan, Yasin, and Andrash, and, and the whole foundations team and more at DeepMind. I got a lot of good feedback, from, uh, a lot of people there, and, and also outside of DeepMind and the U of A, so it's, it's really been wonderful. Uh, so what is this talk about? Uh, So I, I thought that I'm going to start with uh, some, some historical account. I, I re read an old, old paper from 1963, which is before I was born. Um, and you will see that that paper is, is really highly relevant to what I want to talk about later. So we're going to recap what was happening in 1963. And then I will talk about, okay, like how this motivates uh, what we are talking about today and then get to the results and then conclude. So what is this paper? So this is this paper by uh, Richard Bamon, Robert Kalaba and Bella Kotkin. And the title is Polynomial Approximation, a new computational technique in dynamic programming allocation processes. And this is from 1963. So it, this, this paper kind of, change the word, I think. Uh, you can see uh, the title page of the Time Magazine. It actually confirms what I say. Um, so, okay, so what is this paper about? It starts uh, with a simple problem. It's a resource allocation problem. 
it's basically an optimization problem where uh, you have uh, age different values that you need to choose. And uh, the sum of these values have to be B. So you should be thinking about that you have a resource of B uh, and you want to divide it up. And you want to divide it up in such a way that you are maximizing some revenue and this revenue is given in this additive form. So each of these uh, splitted uh, resources are plugged in some nonlinear function. Uh, the first one, A1 is plugged in, in G1 and the H1 is plugged in into GH. You, you want to solve this maximization problem. So pretty fascinated by that uh, these people at the time were thinking about this problem and uh, how hard they were working on it. Uh, so what they figured, split the resource and what's the optimal value. And so what they figured, uh, and that's been in the cooking by, by Bamman and others, is that you should be using value functions and, and dynamic programming and uh, if you do that, then you can maybe approximately solve problems like this. So how does this work? So in, in the context of, of this problem, uh, the value, the optimal value to go, if you are at, uh, you, you already decided about uh, to use some resources and, and the total amount of resources that you use up to stage age is X, um, then, um, Sorry, it's, it's like we're going backwards. It's the other way around. So uh, X uh, is uh, how much uh, resources we can still allocate. And so we're gonna split this resource between the current step. So that's the decision A, and that goes into uh, the first function here. And then all the future steps. And uh, so we're gonna make a step of like, Okay, if we are doing this split, we use all the resources uh, um, potentially, but but not overusing them, and um, and uh, then then the amount of resources that we use uh, is going to increase from x to x plus a, and so if if this function gives us the optimal value for the stages remaining from h plus one to capital H. Uh, then uh, with this boundary condition that you, at, the, at the end you're starting with, I guess this should be B, uh, you're starting with uh, saying that, okay, like I have to, to use all the resources that I have uh, uh, because I need to meet uh, this constraint with equality. Uh, so if uh, I already used X resources, then B minus X is left I need to use that. And so the optimal value is, is that, like that is given by this end condition. So they set up this recursion, it's all good. Uh, so X is this, becomes the state variable. And, and today we recognize that, well, okay, this is like a dynamic system. We are updating and X is a state, and then use an action A, and then you have some immediate reward, and then you make a transition. And then the next state is just like this very simple linear update, X plus A and so on and so forth. So, so this resource allocation becomes an example of uh, maybe planning with uh, a very simple dynamic system and uh, with, with a trivial li linear dynamics and uh, nonlinear cost functions. And uh, now the question is, okay, like how do, we, how do we do any computation here? So how do we compute uh, the optimal value? And um, before this paper, um, they have already been trying to solve these problems. And they, of course, uh, realized uh, very early on that you can just discretize the space of possible values between zero and B. So that, that's your state space. And then you use an epsilon grid. So you're gonna have B over epsilon uh, points on the grid. And uh, then instead of computing everything exactly, you're computing everything approximately and use an, approx an, an interpolation method to fill in the values in between, if you need to fill in values in between. 
And uh, so this is what, what they were looking at, but then they realized that, okay, if we would have a multidimensional version of this allocation problem, so the resources uh, are um, p-dimensional. Uh, so we have p different things that we can split up uh, during this eight-stage process. So this a1 and ah now became vectors uh, in this uh, hypercube. Then the storage of this process is going to grow in a crazy fashion. So you're gonna need B over A to the power of P storage and then compute is going to be, of course, at least proportional to that. So that, that's really bad. Uh, it's a lot of storage. They didn't have uh, a lot of storage. They didn't have fast computers, so they kept thinking. So that, what they came up with in this paper, and this is the, the topic of that paper, is um, this, they call it generalized polynomial approximation, but, but today we would call it uh, linear function approximation. So the idea is, is uh, to come up with some basis functions uh, like the polynomial basis or uh, I don't know, Fourier basis or uh, Lejeune polynomials or Chebyshev polynomials, some, some kind of basis some kind of functions with which you are trying to represent the value functions. And uh, for example, if we choose uh, the Lachrand uh, polynomials, then this is an orthonormal set. Then if we wanted to approximate a function f, then we could just compute uh, the correlation between the function and the polynomial basis uh, because of the orthonormality and then uh, we would get coefficients, which in a least square sense would provide a good approximation to the function. Uh, it would be a best approximation in a least square sense. We could also try to use something uh, more complex. Uh, they note that in the, the, in the paper, like Chebyshev approximation, which minimizes the L infinity norm, but they discard it. They say maybe this L2 approximation is, is good enough. So they roll with that. So. Uh, we chose the Lejean polynomials. We, we do this computation and uh, then they realize, okay, maybe this integral uh, could be problematic to compute. Uh, how are we going to do that? Maybe Monte Carlo at the time, computers are really slow. Maybe it's out of question. So they are thinking about maybe we should go back to Gauss. He suggested to use quadratures. Uh, so that means to set up this, uh, the set of points, or this bar shouldn't be there, uh, in such a way that uh, for polynomials up to some degree, uh, just a simple linear expression with this special set of points gives you the exact integrals. So for all the polynomials, you can get the exact integral. So if, if every function here is going to be a polynomial, then we're not going to lose anything. You know, of course, some of these functions may not be polynomials that we need to do the computation, then we are losing a little bit, but okay, uh, maybe that's, that's not so bad. So this was the, uh, the recommendation. And if we put everything together, then the following procedure pops out. So we choose these very special points, uh, let's say on the, the zero, I don't know, B interval, if, if we are in the zero B interval, zero one, it doesn't matter. Uh, you can renormalize these intervals. So there are these points. These are the XI points. These are the quadrature points. And at these quadrature points, you, you compute the updates, which we would call today the uh, one step look ahead Bauman update or apply the Bauman operator, Bauman optimality operator to the previously obtained value functions. And then here you need the values at, you know, like all of these. Uh, possible future states xi plus a. And uh, so there you have to use uh, this, uh, this expansion, this, uh, this basis function expansion. And uh, you already have the coefficients there. So you're just going to use the coefficients and then do a little co calculation there. Uh, so the maximum, you have to deal with that. They, they write a lot of times about that. Maybe you should use Lagrange multipliers or whatnot. But at the end of the day, they suggest you should discretize. And then that, that's the computation you're going to do. Uh, of course, you have to start somewhere. So the boundary conditions uh, are much simpler. 
So there you can just start with, with these equations. And then uh, once you have the, the special value, the value uh, computed just at the special points, uh, then uh, you can, with the help of the quadrature, the quadrature formula only needs uh, the values of these special points. With the help of the quadrature formula, you can get uh, the uh, parameters uh, that you can plug in and you can continue the procedure backwards. Everyone has seen something like this a million times, but this is like already what's happening in 1963. Uh, it's, it's really amazing. Big revelation. Anyways, uh, so what, what about the compute cost of this uh, procedure? So the, the good news is that the, the storage cost is controlled by a bunch of quantities. So that is R. So that's the, uh, the degree of uh, the polynomials used in the quadrature uh, expression. And that also gives you how many of these base points you have. So that's R. Um, so that those are the number of quadrature points. And uh, that is the other parameter, which is D, which is how many coefficients are you going to have or how many basis functions you have. And this whole storage cost, if you want to store all the value function coefficients and everything, and then during computation, you, ha you have to use some extra temporary memory, then all the storage cost is going to be just H times D plus R. And the compute cost, uh, you can you can just like look at this little equation here, and then uh, so there is going to be some cost associated with evaluating the maximum. You do some discretization, so maybe that's a multiplicative cost. And uh, here you have to do a calculation, and this calculation is going to cost you O D, and you have to do these R times because uh, there are different quadrature points. Uh, so because of that, the compute cost is RT and max cost, and then you have to do this H time. So that, that's the total compute cost. The nice thing is that, uh, well, we are kind of con in control uh, as long as we don't choose R and D to be too high and this discretization level too high, then we are kind of in control. And, and this remains to be true. Uh, this remains true regardless of whether we are using these basis functions in one dimension or multiple dimensions. So that's, that was kind of the revelation that if you are lucky and your optimal value function can be represented with just a few basis functions, then maybe you can get away with and, and solve really high dimensional problems. For them, of course, high dimensional problems uh, meant problems of, I don't know, maybe two, three dimensions and five would be really high. You know, of course, the computers were not too fast. So here are some examples. Uh, so here, I, I think um, uh, a 10 dimensional uh, polynomial and, and I forgot to write, I think that the horizon was something like 10 and uh, I think, oh, maybe this is the horizon, sorry. And, and the number of quadrature points was, no, I, I don't know. Which one is which? Yeah, I think, um, I think this is the horizon 11 and, uh, and the number of quadrature points is, is similarly 10. And uh, they are showing that, okay, we can calculate in special cases for the special functions, the exact values and we can calculate with our approximation algorithm, the values and up to, I don't know, two digits, uh, the, the numbers match up, except some cases uh, which, which are kind of hard to compute. Oh yeah, okay, so this was the number of quadrature points, sorry, it's, uh, okay, let me just fix this. So this is the number of quadrature points and, and the horizon is here, so here, they're solving a problem with h equals one, that that's a trivial problem. This is h equals three, and this is, uh, okay, h equals seven, and this is h equals 10. So they're really happy because uh, they got this, uh, this good match. Uh, here is another example for a different nonlinear function. This is the discretization level for solving the maximization problem. 
that is a nice lineup. Uh, and, and they are, I think, amazed that uh, this procedure works pretty well. Uh, here is a two-dimensional example. So here U is, is two-dimensional. Uh, and, and again, the story is very similar, although they had to increase. So they are using a tensor product construction. So they had to increase uh, both the number of basis functions. So it's five times five basis functions for each dimension. You have five basis functions multiplied by five other basis functions. That's how they get all the combinations of basis functions. And uh, the number of quadrature points is, is 36 uh, and, and they got good results. So it's, it's, it's really nice. This is the computer that they used uh, and the computation time was, uh, they wrote it was seconds to minutes. They, they have some little numbers there. And, and this is how this computer compares to not even today's computers, but the Ottery 2600, which might be familiar from some benchmarks uh, for other folks. These were all days. Uh, today, I think we are probably a billion times faster than this. Um, and they're very optimistic that they write, finally, if we combine these techniques, polynomial approximation, Langrange multiplies, that was for dealing with the max, with the successive approximation, with the that of successive approximation, there should be a very few allocation processes which still resist to reference. So, so that's, that's awesome. Uh, so we might have some questions though, right? Like, Okay, is, is this feasible? Is this viable? Is, is this a good approach? No, we know a lot more, right? But uh, there, are, there are these lingering questions. So the first question one might ask is, uh, how should we choose uh, the basis functions? And uh, how many of these basis functions are we going to need? And here one can think in, in the case of special processes like these allocation processes and whatnot, okay, smoothness is going to happen if uh, the optimums are inside the intervals, then you can maybe use approximation to results to come up with some answers. And uh, you can hope that the optimal value function is also going to be smooth. And if it's not smooth, then maybe we can use wavelets. We have much more uh, elaborate techniques these days. Uh, but I say these are interesting questions, but it is what it is, right? Like if we have to use so many, uh, we will use so many and we can always try and we can always try to use more. I think the more interesting question is the question of computation. Does this really work? Can we always do these calculations? Uh, and uh, get the answers. So here in this paper, there were no theoretical results. There was no attempt to understand how the errors are propagating through these equations, right? So they are using quadratures, maybe in high dimensions, you would need to use something like Monte Carlo. You're going to have errors. And uh, we know from numerical analysis that uh, the errors can just, you know, um, blow up and then cause some big trouble. And at the end of the day, maybe you have to do a lot of calculations to just get those answers, right? So here, the computational question that uh, I, I think is really interesting, and we are going to be after this question in this talk, is that if the optimal value function, someone tells you that, the hey, this is the problem, the optimal value function can be written as the linear combination of these basis functions. Here are the basis functions. You do the computation for me. C can you do it in poly time, please? Uh, and th that is the question. And, and we don't want to make more assumptions about uh, the underlying uh, dynamic program. Uh, I'm going to reformulate everything in ter terms of MDPs. So we, I'm not going to want to make more assumptions about the MDPs. I just want uh, to know whether if someone gives me some value of some basis functions and promises that the value function can be written as the linear combination of these basis functions, then can I do the computation for this person? Can someone do the computation for this person? So th this is the question that I'm going to ask. Any questions? Uh, is this clear? Yeah, there's no question so far. All right, okay, all right. 
So now this is uh, where we're going to connect to uh, to Dimitri's talk as well a little bit. Uh, so the way I'd like to phrase this is uh, it's in the context of, of Markov decision processes. And I, I don't think that I have to introduce for this audience what the Markov decision process is. Uh, you have states and actions. Say if you take an action in a state, you get the next state, which is stochastic. You get an associated reward and then maybe you sum up the reward over a finite horizon or you uh, sum up the reward over an infinite horizon with discounting, take the expected value, you want to maximize uh, the, the, the so-called return and then you want to discover good actions to take. Um, and the setting that uh, I want to answer this, this question that was on the previous slide is, is the is the setting of, of online planning, which is the setting where MPC works, model predictive control also works. So what is this setting? So in this setting, there is this environment, uh, which is represented by this MDP, this big black box here. So this is the environment. And the environment is sending a state to our planner. So this is going to be our planner. So the planner receives the state, the current state, and then the planner has access to a simulator of, of the exact same word. So there is no mismatch there. We can talk about what happens. We understand what happens with mismatch. So it's, I don't think it's a big deal. Uh, so let's assume for simplicity that there is no mismatch. The computational question is still super interesting. So there is no mismatch. There is a simulator. And you can ask queries from the simulator of like, oh, what would have happened if in this state, I would take this action, what would be the next state? And the simulator responds with uh, random responses like, oh, this would be a random next state and this would be the associated reward. And the planner can do this querying for a while, but okay, maybe there are some time constraints. So eventually it needs to stop and we are gonna be interested in Okay, for how long does it need to query the simulator uh, before it can spit out an action? And when it's system, which, which is going to make a stochastic transition with the same underlying dynamics as what is used in the simulator. And we want, we are interested in designing planners. So that is this, this box here that is doing the querying and doing some calculations to spit out an action such that in this closed loop, this is, this is a closed loop, right? In this closed loop, the planner, uh, when it's used in this closed loop mode, achieves a high reward, right? So this is the setting of MPC, right? Uh, I can use a simulator and I can do some little look ahead planning and like do whatever. Uh, maybe I can use rollouts. All right. so. Um, before getting to the results, I want to introduce two kinds of subproblems, which come with two types of access models. So the, the first access model is I call it the global access model. So in online planning with global access model, the job is to fill out uh, the code for, for this uh, function, which I call get action. So this get action, we have to write the code for this get action, which is going to be used in the planner. So it was on the, the previous uh, slide. This is this get action. It will be called with the current state. Uh, and, uh, and we have to return an action. I think that like I'm kind of missing a, a state there. Um, anyways, and uh, so if we have a global access to the sim global access um, simulator, uh, then we that means that we can query the simulator at any state action pair and get, we can get all the features uh, ahead of time. And here I'm going to imagine that we have finitely many, but many, many, many state action pairs. And this counts as a single operation. So it's, it's a very forgiving uh, model, right? Like if in the global access model, uh, it turns out that, uh, every good planner needs to use a lot of queries, then that's going to mean that, okay, this is a really hard problem, right? Because it's a very forgiving model. You can access the features, you can pre-process the features. Computation, I'm not going to count computation. I'm just going to count how many times 
we're going to access the simulator. And this is this is the access of the simulator. So this this counts one call as well. So in this code, there are two calls. And if this is in a loop, then maybe this would happen, you know, a number of times. And that's going to be the query cost of, of this routine. And at the end, uh, as I said, the uh, the procedure needs to return an action and such that for the policy pie in use in this closed loop operation, it has to be that optimal. So it has to approximate the optimal value up to that accuracy. And that is going to be an input. And this should happen with high probability and this psi parameter is another input, uh, which determines this probability with which this has to happen. And the other version of, of this problem is the local access version, where uh, you're given uh, this initial state. And uh, in the local access model, the query is similar to the simulator, but there are two differences. You can only query the simulator at states that we have previously encountered, either in this call of this function or a previous call, we can have global memory to save data between the calls. And um, that's one difference. The other difference is that the way you can access the features is only through this call. So when this happens, when this call happens, then let's say we have uh, state features. Uh, so that means that we are trying to approximate the optimal value function, not the optimal action value function. Here I had state action features. Doesn't matter, we, we do both. Um, but here, if we have state features, uh, then we get for the next state, the corresponding feature vector as well in this call. So that's how you learn about what are the features that you can uh, work with. And this is way more realistic than uh, assuming that we can have a big table of the features at all state action pairs. Well, usually there are so many state action pairs that you can't even read this table anyways. And it's also uh, not really realistic to assume that we know all the states and we can list all the states, which is what is assumed in this global access model. I use the global access model because we will have a lot of lower bounds and then there the lower bound is going to be stronger in the global access model. And the upper bounds mostly are going to happen in this local access model. And there is another model, which is I call the online access model, uh, where you can't even call the simulator. You just like run and uh, whatever you see is, is, is what you, you get. So it's, that's like the online learning thing. You can, you can only go, sorry. So, so here you can reset the simulator to a previously seen state in the online setting, the online access model. Uh, you can only go back to the initial state or roll out up to the end. So you can only generate whole trajectories. There is no going back to a state and saying that, oh, but I want to know more of the next states at this stage. Like you can't do that. So that's, I call the online access. That's the most stringent version. And so if we can design algorithms for that, then that applies to local access, that applies to global access. I hope this is clear. All right, so, so this is what uh, was happening before uh, we, had, we had this paper out uh, at the end of the summer. Um, so this table summarizes uh, some results that have been out there for this setting. And so the very first result, uh, that's uh, by Jen Wang and Ben uh, Van Roy. Uh, so this is for the setting where you actually have, uh, this, this works in the online access model too. So it's, it's, it's really great. And the only assumption that they make, it's finite horizon. So all of these results are going to be for the finite horizon setting most of the time you can rewrite them for the discounted setting. And I have no idea about what to do for the average cost and the other settings. So those are really interesting questions. And so age is, is going to be the horizon uh, in this table. A is uh, the number of actions. And what else do we have here? D is the number of basis functions. Uh, we have seen that before. And uh, so this thing here, 
uh, this column is an MDP class. So this is what MDPs this ergotum applies or this result applies to. And, and so this says that this applies to all the MDPs which, are, which come with these features. So I call this featureized MDP. So MDP plus feature map, such that the feature map realizes the optimal action value function. So for this audience, I don't really need to introduce the optimal action value function. I, I just write what this realization means. So uh, you have states and actions and uh, the realization is going to mean that there are some unknown parameter vectors. There is an unknown parameter vector with D components such that with these basis functions that are a function of state action pairs now, uh, you can reproduce the optimal action value function. So you take an MDP and the feature map together, and this is what's in the MDP class. And then the planner can interact with this uh, in one of the access models. And here we have another restriction, unfortunately. So this is an upper bound result. That's why it's green. Uh, you can get polynomial sample complexity here. And, and this restriction is that the MDP has to be fully deterministic. So rewards deterministic and uh, transitions deterministic. But uh, this is essentially the setting of the 1963 uh, paper. Um, except that here we're talking about Q sterilizability, not V sterilizability. So the next uh, result um, chronologically would be this result, which is uh, by, by Galliard and, uh, and, um, and uh, Phil and, and Barnabash and Yasin and Nan and, and myself, and it appeared at, at COD. So this is this paper. Uh, so in this paper, uh, we figured an ergotum which gives a positive answer for the case when the V star function, the optimal state value function is linearly realizable, but only in the case when the number of actions is constant. So what, what do I mean by this? Well, this is, a, this is a result that looks like this. We have a polynomial sample complexity where the polynomial looks like this. You have D and H divided by the desired precision. So that's the delta and uh, raised to the power of A. And, and there is this B parameter, by the way, the B parameter, you, you see it everywhere. So that's for the sake of precision, the, we assume that the norm of the optimal parameter vector is, is less than B it shows up everywhere so we have to we have to include that um, so here if if a is like two then okay this is like a second uh, degree polynomial and like okay so this expression here itself doesn't add more to the degrees it just multiplies things and applies some constants um, so essentially this is the order of the polynomial so you can see that if you have a lot of actions, then things could be really bad for this ergotum. And then one is worried about, okay, is, is this going to work? And uh, it happens that uh, we had an earlier result that said that, well, in a very close related setting where we are, okay, so here, this was for B sterilizability, this is for Q sterilizability. For Q sterilizability, if you allow exponentially many actions in the smallest of uh, the, uh, the number of basis functions and the horizon age, you have, can have this many actions, then uh, there is no polynomial time ergotum. So there is an exponential lower bond in this case. And, and this also applies for MDPs where the transitions are deterministic. It's enough if the rewards are stochastic or um, the, the transitions are stochastic. Of course, if both were deterministic, then we would be in, in, in this realm where we have the poly sample complexity results. So it's, it's really interesting that, okay, deterministic MDPs 
that they seem to be much easier in this sense, right? Like stochasticity is, is indeed, okay, maybe it's not too surprising, but I rarely see uh, results that uh, explicate this so clearly. Stochastic MDPs can be just like way harder. All right. So what is the, the third uh, paper? So that, that's the paper by uh, Simon Du, Shamka Gadachis, and Lee Shakalovedgarov, Mahachan, Ben San, and Rosong Gwang. And then the, I, I just remember this paper as the bilinear paper. It, it's a very nice paper. It proposes a general framework for achieving polysample complexity that encompasses a lot of the previous works. And so in this paper, uh, one, of the result, in, one of the results implies that under global access, so by the way, this paper is for local access, but this paper is for global access. So under global access, and uh, we'll see why this is important later, under global access, if both V star and Q star are linearizable with some you know, different set of basis functions, um, then you can design an algorithm regardless of whether the MDP is deterministic or not, not uh, which has a polynomial sample complexity. So that's, that's that paper. And so we see that like, okay, there is something here, things are moving, but there are lots of open questions left, right? So we have kind of like two extremes, uh, constant number of actions or exponential number of actions. What's in between? And also there is a mismatch between these two results because uh, this is for V sterilizability and that's the other one is for Q sterilizability. And like, okay, like how about like Q sterilizability with a constant number of actions? How about uh, V sterilizability with exponential many actions? And how about if you have polynomial many actions, right? So that's kind of like the interesting middle ground where the number of actions maybe can grow as a polynomial function of D and H, uh, that's the gray zone. Uh, so that, that is the question that uh, we are after. So long story short, uh, it is the, uh, the new part of the table. Uh, so this is the new results. So here uh, in the first part of, of this table, we see that if we allow an action count, which grows mildly as a function of uh, the dimension and the horizon, then unfortunately, polynomial sample complexity is not possible anymore for a lot of different settings. And these are the settings when you have Q star reliability. And uh, okay, you can have deterministic transitions everywhere. So the, these are that, that uh, this signals that. Or you can have this for Q, V star reliability, or you can also have this for V star and Q star reliability for those states which are reachable from the initial state, from the state where the planning is. Like, you know, this in this closed loop, we are starting from some state. And uh, if V star and Q star reliability doesn't hold globally, so then Simon do this at, uh, here this V star Q star reliability was true everywhere in the state space and they had global access. So they could pre-process with the feature maps and rule out a lot of possible coefficients because of this. And we see that just by changing this so that V star Q star are not globally realizable, but only reachable realizable, we see that we move this problem into the realm of impossibility. So the polymer sample complexity is gone. At the same time, we have continuing the previous work where we had a constant number of actions. If we have a constant number of actions, then the previous arguments can be extended and now, we can have a positive result for, for example, V star realizability. And uh, we have a positive result for V star Q star reachable realizability. And these are all for local access. So here we don't need to go for look, global access. And this is for global access. So even if you have, you know, these super powered 
uh, calls to the simulator it, it doesn't have. And, um, and, and finally, uh, if you have queue standardizability, okay, we have a little problem here because we only know that you can have the polynomial simple complexity when the dynamics is deterministic. All right, so how does this work? Uh, wh why do we have these results? So I don't have a lot of time and I wanna save some time for questions. Uh, so we do have a construction, this hardness construction. It's like the, the gist of it is that we are trying to construct a problem which has a certain transition structure where the actions are kind of setting. So we have these vectors, these WI vectors, which are p-dimensional vectors. And, and the, the planner or, or, or the learner or like whoever wants to solve this MDP uh, needs to match the bits of this vector or the components of this vector to a secret vector W star. And all of these leave uh, on the corners of a hypercube. And uh, okay, so the, the W star is, is close to the equator somehow. So this is your W star. So it's, it's not, not very uh, close to, uh, to this point, this, this North Pole, the, the all one vector. And uh, so they're like nicely staying away of, of this. And, and the planner in a way starts from the all one vector and needs to modify the components individually. And it has to do this for K rounds and uh, capital K rounds and capital K times P that's going to be the horizon of the, the planning horizon. Um, and uh, if it does this, and uh, it can also quit earlier. If it quits at some point, then it, it gets this reward, which is the product of a lot of terms. And these terms are comparing how much the weight vectors have changed. And the weight vectors need to change a lot. And this happens until, okay, we quit. And at the end, we compare it to W star. And so uh, the learner or the planner is going to be forced to take a certain number of steps. These numbers are all going to be smaller than one. And so the more steps it takes, the kind of smaller reward it's going to get, exponentially smaller reward it's going to get. Okay. And uh, so that's going to force the planner to try to come up with a short sequence and guess the W star vector. And if it delays this information, then or it, it, it tries to, to take too many steps, then it, it's going to get much fewer information. And, and this function G has to be chosen in this, uh, it, it's chosen in this decreasing manner. So, it's, it, uh, so there are two functions here. This is the actual function that we choose and the idea was to kind of approximate this one over one minus p to the power of x and have an upper close approximation. Uh, and that's, that's this expression here. Um, and, and, and all this, uh, okay, so how, how does this work? So there is this abstract game where right? in the interaction, uh, the player has to choose these vectors uh, and, and it has to declare whether it's done or not. If, it's, if it says that it's done, then it has to choose exactly eight vectors. And then the payoff that it's going to receive is going to be uh, the, the value of this function applied to the prefix of this sequence of vectors up to the i's round, where the i is the first w vector that it picked which is close enough to W star. This age is the Hamming distance here. So it's just like how much overlap they have. They should have a large overlap or the number of differences between them should be less than P over four. And so, so that's, that's the end. Like uh, it, it can uh, query uh, before that, if it's not done, 
then it's going to receive some feedback and the feedback is going to be like very meager information. It's, it's basically receiving feedback about whether uh, in the one but last, the penultimate uh, vector that it shows, whether it's close to W star. And it also receives the same information for the last component of the W vector that that's close to W star. So that's, that's this. And finally, if uh, either it went at, at the, to the end or it, it hit um, with, the, uh, with the last vector, it hit a point, it hit basically in the small neighborhood of W star, then it's going to get some, some extra information. It's, it's a Bernoulli random variable whose mean is this, uh, is this value. So this is the reward kind of thing. So it's like, you can see this, this is a nonlinear bandit game with structured, uh, structured payoff function, where the, the structure of the payoff function is known. The only unknown is W star. You have to choose this Ws and, and you receive some more information than just like the payoff, okay? Um, and uh, the question is, okay, a, a player, how many uh, queries does it need to submit before it can get a good reward? And uh, for that, the result is that it has to use a lot. So if we only want to have a, a, a player whose expected reward is like, I don't know, 0 0.01 close to the optimum re reward that it could have received, then it has to, the number of uh, queries that, that it submits, uh, it, it has to be exponential in, in the smaller of P and K. And the reason is that the planner only gets info when, when it hits a neighborhood of a W star and the chance of hitting this neighborhood is exponentially small if P gets large. And so many queries are going to be needed. Uh, so why this particle construction? Well, it it's helps with this MDP reliability and, and keeping a large gap. So uh, <clears throat> I'm not going to go into the details. This kind of shows the MDP construction. Uh, so these triangles, each of them correspond to choosing a W. And so here you are choosing one of the Ws, you're choosing W of K here. And then here you're choosing W K of K plus one. And the state is kind of the history. It's just like a huge tree, except that sometimes you quit and like uh, you go to this exit line and then you terminate there. And uh, the, the dynamics is otherwise trivial. It's just a tree dynamics and, and deterministic. And uh, so here, uh, the actions mean there are K actions. So there are P actions. They mean I want to flip some component of the vector. So if, I, if my action is I, that means that I want to change W. Uh, so I'm, I'm playing with W K of I, and now I want to change the sign of it. So I flip the sign of, of W. And there are special rules like uh, we wanted to have these vectors. Uh, it was important that these vectors in this sequence, the player has to choose them such a way that they are far away from each other. So that ensures that these terms are bounded away from one and uh, all together, the reward is going to decay very fast. Uh, so that was important. So in order to ensure that here, what we do is that for the first P over four steps, we are forcing the player to not take any repeats. If, if it repeats any of the actions that happened before, in this stage, then it immediately quits. We can do that because the, the history is, is the state. So we can remember whether that was happening. So this is all legit MDP dynamics. And uh, later on, if uh, there is any repeats, so we want to prevent repeats, then 
then we're going to freeze the, the weight vector. And from that point on up to the end, the weight vector stays the same. And uh, there are all these cases which correspond to how we are giving information that corresponds to quitting and giving some reward. And so you can encode basically the whole game, the previous game in the form of an MDP, but you can also show that uh, the optimal value function is, uh, can be written as uh, the linear combination of some basis functions. And the reason for that is because uh, all these, uh, so when, when, when we look at the reward here, uh, so the first question is, can we, can we even like at the very end when we receive the reward, can we encode that information? And the reason you can do that is because you can store this as a constant value in the state that's associated with the state that can be part of the feature. So that can be computed based on state information. That's a feature value. It doesn't reveal any information about the W star. And then here in the last step, you just have this function. This is a quadratic function of X. And X here is just this Hamming function. And the Hamming function is just a linear, it's just an inner product and a shift, right? So all together in a way, this is a fourth order polynomial. So, so we can encode everything with polynomials. And, uh, so that's linear uh, after some basis function expansion. Uh, so realizability is going to hold and everything holds and, and you get this uh, negative result. So um, time's up. I'm not going to talk about the upper bound. Uh, that would have been too much. Uh, we filled the table. Um, so what's next? Uh, so one very obviously missing row from this table is when you have Q star realizability, no other restrictions, and you have a constant number of actions. And like, ah, and you can have stochastic transitions, and we don't know uh, whether this is, uh, this should be a green line or a green row, or it should be a pink row. Um, we didn't talk about compute cost. Uh, even for the polynomial time results, it's a polynomial query complexity we don't have an efficient, computationally efficient algorithm for that case. The algorithm of Van and Roy is efficient. And the algorithm of Duotel is not going to be efficient because it has to do this impossible pre-processing. Um, so that's the, the state of the art now. Uh, and, and this was all for just the case when we started Q-sterilizable, we, we like there are, so many other things you can do, like stronger assumptions about a function approximator. You're hoping to gain a lot. Maybe you gain this computation, nonlinear function approximation, how to do that well, contain section spaces. So, so that was the motivating example, right? So in that case, uh, I, I don't know, Robert uh, Saraf. All right, thank you. That's it. Yeah, thank you, Chaba, for that very uh, excellent talk. There's a question by Aditya Gopalan. Maybe Aditya, you can just unmute yourself and go ahead and ask. Yeah. Hi, Chaba, this is Aditya. Uh, my, my question is, uh, so you separate uh, these problem classes uh, as easy as hard, depending on whether uh, they have polynomial or exponential uh, query complexity. So I'm just curious to know what uh, parameter or parameters of the problem instance uh, sort of uh, make this uh, thing polynomial or exponential? Is it a particular one like the horizon or the state space or the action space or the... So when, when I say it's polynomial, it has to be polynomial in both B, D, H, and A. It has to be polynomial in everything. If it fails to be polynomial in any of them, then I don't call it polynomial. So when it fails, uh, is it is it uh, particularly in some parts of these parameters that it fails to become polynomial, or is, is there uh, in all all, all examples? Uh, so the so the lower bonds look like two to the minimum of D and H. That that's all the exponential lower bonds. Okay, okay, okay. Can I ask another yeah, question? So, yeah, please. Go but ahead. but but I think another answer to your question is, by the way, is that. It seems that the number of actions plays the most important role here. Okay, okay. Looking at this table, right? Like the number of actions. If you have lots of actions, then things can be really bad. 
and uh, even for moderate actions, it seems moderately many actions, it seems that we are not in a good position. Anyways, right. Go very interesting. Yeah. So, so the other question is, uh, can you comment uh, a little on the uh, upper bound, the algorithmic techniques uh, that that are used to achieve these upper bounds? Uh, yeah, yeah. So I wanted to to make more connections to to Dimitri's talk there. Uh, the the algorithm itself it's almost like a td algorithm um, but it's not uh, so it's it's like it has this version space uh, so let's say it's v starterizable okay so we are trying to design an algorithm under the condition that the v star function can be written as linear combination of these basis functions and if we want to find this parameter if we found the parameter we can use the Simulator with a little look ahead and then come off as a good actions, right? Because then we would know what V star is and, and we would we would be able to do one step look ahead with the simulator. So uh, the only question is what is this theta star? And uh, the way we uh, do this is that we keep a version space of like all possible theta stars that were not yet ruled out based on the data collected so far. And then amongst these, uh, we choose uh, the optimistic one, which maximizes the initial value according to, or basis functions predictions, uh, right? The basis functions are supposed to help you to predict what the values could be. So you choose the most optimistic parameter, and then you run a verification procedure, which is doing rollouts we said policy, which is induced by these parameters. This could be just like the, the usual uh, one-step look ahead, argmax, uh, greedy policy with respect to this parameter vector. It could be that. And, and you run this look ahead until you notice. And when you're running the look ahead, you're verifying whether the Bauman equation holds by using the simulator. And if you detect that the Bauman equation at some state that you encountered didn't hold, then you take notice. You say, ah, oh, no, OK, I have to go back to the planning phase. So you stop your simulation, you stop your rollouts, and then you, this allows you to refund, re restrict more the version space, and then you do the replanning. And it, it turns out that uh, this is enough, and and this this gives you uh, the poly uh, poly time results. Okay, great. So it's a relatively simple thing. Does it make sense? Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, I guess. Uh, then are there any other questions? All right, I guess there are no other questions. So on behalf